Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30, it was predicted that after the apostles' death, there would be an apostasy would infect the congregation. And it says in chapter 20, verses 19, uh, 29 and 30, I know that after my going away, oppressive wolves will enter in among you, will not treat the flock with tenderness. From among you yourselves men will rise and speak twisted things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Now, how long would this situation last? Daniel, chapter 12, and uh, verse 4, says at the time of the end, Christianity would flourish again. The deeper things of God would again be known as never before comprehended, and they would be gradually understood. In, ja in Daniel, chapter 12, Verse 4 says, As for you, O Daniel, make secret the words, seal up the book until the time of the end. Many will rove about, but the true knowledge will become abundant. Now what we're going to do this evening is we're going to go back through some of the history of Jehovah's modern day organization and see ways that seemingly, apparently, Jehovah has manipulated things to cause his will to be done. Interesting point was made in the Watchtower, September 15, 1998. It said, Jehovah is not necessarily responsible for all the changes among the nations, yet he can intervene when he chooses to do so in order to accomplish his purpose. And the things we're going to discuss this evening are situations where it appears that perhaps Jehovah did just that. He intervened to cause his purpose to be carried out. Now, one thing that naturally comes to a person's mind when they think about the modern-day organization, why was it established in the United States of America? Why not... The Middle East, that's where it started, right? Israel? Why wouldn't it have been perhaps in France, Europe? After all, in the 1870s to 1900, in fact, all up until the First World War, the diplomatic center of the earth was Paris. All ambassadors spoke French. So why wouldn't it have been in, in uh, Paris, France, that this thing would be established? Well, you stop and think. What has happened in the Middle East in the 20th century? What happened in Europe in the 20th century? See, the United States of America was a place where there has not been a war fought on U.S. soil since 1865, the end of the Civil War. So it's a place where there's been relative calm. It's a country with a government that was relatively tolerant of people of varying different ideologies, so it'd be a safe haven for this work to, to be carried on from here. And it's a very industrialized country with uh, speedy uh, shipping and, and so forth, so it's a good place for, for things to be focused. So it makes sense that it would be in this, in this country. But now in the spring of... 1919, the directors of the Watchtower Society decided that they were going to do their own printing. Up until that time, they wrote all the articles, all the books, but they sent the manuscripts to a printing company who would print the material for us and send the books and the literature back, and then we'd distribute it. But the brothers decided in 1919, as trade unions started to get a grip on all sorts of industry, the brothers said, we're not going to be crippled by a trade union in any, any craft because they can go out on strike and we'll still be able to print because we're doing it ourselves. So they bought the uh, equipment. Brother C.A. Wise was told to go find a piece of property, someplace that they could at least uh, lease for a time. And he found a property over on, on uh, Myrtle Avenue, 35 Myrtle Avenue in, in Brooklyn. 
just a few blocks from our Bethel house at uh, 25, or probably 124 Columbia Heights. They rented three floors of a building, and they put the presses in there, and they went to putting together the print shop. Now, they had one little problem. Nobody at Bethel knew anything about the printing business. So what are they going to do? Well, we're going to leave the brothers in Brooklyn with all their shiny new equipment, and we're going to take a trip out to Minnesota about the same time period when there was a young man, actually a 16-year-old teenager. His name was William Peterson. He was an orphan in an orphanage out there in Minnesota. And if you know anything about what was going on in orphanages in those years, they were little sweatshops. They were all like little slaves working for the people who ran the orphanage. And this young man, Peterson, got tired of being worked like a, uh, an adult, and he ran away from the orphanage. And he had to get a job. Now, he's on his own. He's got to support himself. So he went around trying to find work, and he got a job at the St. Paul Free Press newspaper, sweeping the floor around the linotype machines. Now, this lad was a mechanical genius. He could watch a piece of equipment being worked for a short period of time and figure out exactly what it took to make it work. And in no time at all, he was not sweeping the floor around the linotype machine. He was running the linotype machine for the newspaper. In fact, he was the number one linotype operator that they had when he was just barely 20 years old. And about that same time, he was exposed to the truth. He got some publications from the Watchtower Society, read it, liked what he saw, became one of us immediately. Found out that the brothers in New York were trying to put together a printing operation, volunteered, went to New York, set up the printing presses for them, got everything running. And he continued to be there until he died just a few years ago. Pete Peterson was the number one linotype man in the world. Nobody at linotype, which is the company that made the machine, uh, nobody at the company was as good with the machines as Pete was. In fact, if they had a problem, the company had a problem they couldn't resolve, they would call the Watchtower Society and they'd say, we got to talk to Pete Peterson. And they'd charge him a con consulting fee to put Pete on the phone, and he'd solve the problem for them. He'd, they could just talk to him, explain to him, he'd ask qu questions for a while, and then he'd tell them what to do, and they'd fix it on the phone. One time at uh, uh, the operation at 117 Adam Street, they uh, had a machine that was stuck, plugged up, wouldn't work, and uh, they had Brother Peterson walk around and look at it. He told the brother to do this and this, and he tried it, and nothing happened. Walked around, looked at some more, tried this, that, nothing happened. He went to his toolbox, got a ball peen hammer, walked over to the machine, and went, bap! He said, now try it. <laughs> Works fine. One of the brothers said, I could have done that. Pete said, no, you couldn't. You didn't know where to hit it or how hard. <laughs> and the man knew what he was talking about. He had patents on the, pa on the linotype machine that linotype had to pay us to use. He was that good. He was shy. But the question that comes to mind is, of all the places that young man could have gotten a job when he got out of the orphanage, he could have gone to a bakery, a blacksmith, you know. Why a print shop? Why did he come into the truth just when we needed someone to run a print shop? You think that's a coincidence? Well, let's see another situation. That was in the, the early years, in 19... 60s, a revolution was sweeping the printing industry. Uh, they knew everybody was going from what they call letter set press, the old type, which is kind of like a rubber stamp, ink, paper, uh, to offset, which is the way all, everybody does today. But now you can operate an offset press uh, doing small jobs mechanically, manually. But to run a press to the speed that we need it done, an offset press must be operated by a computer. You cannot make the adjustments fast enough manually. It's got to be done by a computer. But we had one weensy little problem here. Uh, nobody at Bethel knew how to turn a computer on, let alone work one. That is, until... A brother, Ralph Brander, retired from International Business Machines, IBM, one of the two companies in the United States that made computers, 
and Ralph retired from IBM and volunteered to come to Bethel. And uh, he and Curtis Williford, a young Bethelite there at Wallkill, wrote a computer program that got them printing literature on their presses. But they could only print in Latin-based font. That is, anything that would be like English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, German, etc. They had to have that font. If it had anything like Chinese, forget it. We couldn't do that. But now, they, at least they got the presses running. But now, we're going to leave the presses running here in, in Wallkill. There's a printing magazine there in Wallkill with the, pre, with the computer-driven offset presses. But we're going to take a trip now over to Japan. In the 1960s, the Japanese computer companies were trying to figure out a way that they could get up to or past the two big computer giants in the United States, which was IBM and Compaq. Now, the, com the people in Japan do things that Americans would never dream of doing. When they have a problem to solve, the companies cooperate with each other. Isn't that strange? That they would actually, you know, can you see GM, Chrysler, Ford putting all their engineers together in one room to try to figure out what to do? No, not on your life. See, but that's the, the computer people in, in Japan did just exactly that. All of them put their people, their top computer minds, got together in one office. And all they did was try to talk and decide, what are we going to do? How can we solve the problem? Now, while one of those computer geniuses was at his home one day, a pioneer sister called on him in the door-to-door -door work. And through the course of the conversation, she mentioned to him, of course we know that the last days began in 1914, and he said, excuse me, how do we know this? And a poor sister is thinking, oh my word, what have I said? Would you, in your wildest dreams, bring up that subject on an initial call? You wait till somebody's got some foundation in the Bible study before you bring up that. It's complicated. But her poor sister said a prayer, took a deep breath. She started in Daniel, Ezekiel, Numbers, 607, 2520, but it wasn't 607 years, it's 606 years and three months because it's October, November, December of 607. So you subtracted the whole year, so at the end you come to 1913, but you've got to add another nine months at the end, which brings you to October 1914. And about that time the man's wife came in and she said, what's this? The man took the sister's Bible, excused himself, turned to Daniel, Ezekiel, Numbers, 607, 2520, and the sister's going, <laughs> but the man's a genius, right? He's brilliant. Now, what's his job? His job is to go to the office and share ideas. And many of those computer geniuses in Japan are now your brothers and sisters. They solve their problem. Computers inherently have 640 kilobytes of random access memory. That's it. And Bill Gates said in 1981, that's all any computer will ever need. <laughs> now you have to have gigabytes of RAM to, to operate a computer. And that came out of that think tank in Japan. And after they solved their problem, by the way, IBM was just sold to an Asian company last year. So I guess they did the job. But, but, um, after they solved the problem, some of those computer geniuses who had come into the truth retired, took leave of absence, or quit, and came to the United States. And they went to Walk Hill, and together they wrote a program that would print in any font, any language there is. They called it the Multi-Language Electronic Photo Typesetting System. What did you say? MEPS, that's right. That's where it came from. It all came because a sister said 1914 on the doorstep. And I don't think she really said, I think an angel said, 1914. She says, why? I didn't. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> but at any rate, the point is that we now are able to print. You know that little booklet you've got that's good news for people of all nations? Maps. That's where it came from. So now you see that we can print. By the way, for a time... Reader's Digest was paying us royalties to use maps. 
They've gone beyond that. The Watchtower Society has gone way beyond that now. We're, we're not using maps. They've, got, they've graduated far beyond. That was, that was 30 years ago. But that's, uh, that was the beginning. But it all came from, uh, somebody said, 1914. Interesting thing. Just remarkable to see that Jehovah has this whole thing under control. Okay, we're going to take another trip this time. We're going to go this time across the other ocean. We're going to go to Great Britain, 1955. In 1900, the first branch office outside the United States was set up in England. In 1911, they, they were set at their headquarters at uh, Craven Terrace, 35 Craven Terrace, England, London, England. In 1955, 44 years later, they had outgrown the facility at Craven Terrace. There was no more way to expand. They couldn't grow out, in, up, down. There's no place else to go. They had to find another property to build the Bethel. And they found one out in the northwest corner of London on a road called the Ridgeway. Now, this road is located in what is called a green belt in London. A green belt is an area that is so steeped in the history of Great Britain that even the trees are registered with the government in England. If you have one of those registered trees growing in your property, you can't cut a limb off of it without permission from the Home Office. You've got to get government permission to do anything to the tree because it's part of the history of the country. Now, the property that we're building on was on one side of the Ridgeway, the road, the sewer main was on the other side. Now, the British people are totally, may surprise you, un-American. See, Americans, Americans are so intelligent. We're so logical. See, we put in a brand new street, then pave it, put the seal coat on, put the stripe down the middle, put in the gutters and the curbs and the sidewalks. They would jackhammer the whole thing out, put in a sewer line and patch it with asphalt. See, we can do things so logically. The British says, you can connect to the sewer main, but don't touch the street. You've got a tunnel underground, under the road, to reach the sewer main. So they're down tunneling, trying to reach the sewer main, underground, and as they're tunneling through, they ran into the rootstock of one of those registered trees. Now what? Well, the brother in charge of the operation says, look, we've got to go to the left or to the right. And since our God is always right, we're going to the right. So they went to the right of the tree and they hit that sewer main right where they connected the sewer main. There was a coupling, a connection already there. All they had to do was go, and they were ready to go. That coupling did not exist on any of the maps of the sewer system of Greater London. How did it get there? Never forget who is in charge of this operation. Kind of reminds you of uh, 2 Kings 2020 with Hezekiah, you know, tunneling from the Pool of Siloam and from inside Jerusalem. They met in the middle without GPS. That's amazing. But it's uh, Jehovah's work in this thing. Okay. Now, I said that in 19... 19, they did their own printing. In 1922, they rented a piece of property on uh, Myrtle Street. A couple of years later, they had to move it over to Concord Street. They outgrew that. The brothers knew they were going to have to build their own printery. They had to build their own building. They had the plans drawn up for an eight-story printery building that they are going to construct, and they found the perfect property for this press uh, printing operation at the north end of Columbia Heights Boulevard. See, we're at 124 Columbia Heights. That's where Bethel was. And just up at the end of the street, just about a block and a half away, was a perfect piece of ground that they could buy and put a printery on. Squibb Pharmaceutical was willing to pay more money for the property. They got it. We didn't. Our brothers were just sick because the next nearest property we could get was way over on the other side of the Brooklyn Bridge over at 117 Adams Street, which is where the printery had to be built. But when Squibb went to build at 25 Columbia Heights, where we thought we were going to build, they found nothing but mud 20 feet down under the grass. It'd be like trying to build a building on jello. You, they had to put down 1,100 pilings into the ground, fill the whole thing with concrete, just to have a foundation to build the building. That was in 1927. Uh, in 19, uh, 
69, 42 years later, Squibb moved out, practically gave us that building, which is where our executive offices are today. But see, they did the work, they paid the money, we still got the building. <laughs> Never forget, you're dealing with the sovereign of the universe here. Okay, um, 1912. Brother Russell wanted to determine which countries should have branch offices in them. So he took a trip around the world. And he wound up in Manila in the Philippines in 1912. And he did what he did in every major city he, he landed in. He would rent the largest auditorium he could and then advertise to give a lecture free of cost. And he rented the Manila Opera House and advertised he's going to give a, a lecture in the Opera House. But the clergy found out about it and they tried to stop the contract. They tried to get the, the man management to cancel the contract. Don't let him speak there. Now we're going to leave Brother Russell in Manila turning in the wind. Is he going to give a talk or not? And we're going to take a, an excursion back to the United States. We're going to go back in time to 1866. West Point, New York. U.S. Military Academy. A young man, William P. Hall, graduated West Point in uh, 1866, became obviously second lieutenant, William P. Hall, was attached to the 7th Cavalry under the command of Colonel George A. Custer in the Dakota Territories. Now, Custer, uh, all, all Union officers after the Civil War ended in 1865, all officers took a one-position cut in rank and pay. Custer had been a brigadier general, and he was cut to colonel. Colonel to lieutenant colonel, lieutenant colonel to major, and right on down the line. Um, so he wanted that star back. He was a brigadier general. He liked having a star on his shoulder. He wanted that star back. And he thought the best thing to do, he could get that star back, is kill as many Indians as possible to let him have the star back. Well, of course, he was told by the War Department, that's what the Defense Department is now, it's called the War Department then, they told Custer, leave the Indians alone. We've got enough trouble out there without you creating more havoc by stirring up the Indians. Leave them alone. Well, Custer, of course, did everything by Custer. He didn't care what the, the War Department said. Lieutenant Hall was one of those officers who did everything by the book. And he knew what the orders said. It was shared with all the officers. And so every time Custer would try to countermand an officer, he had this lieutenant in his face, by your leave, sir, the orders were thus and such, the book says this and that. And Custer knew he was going to have trouble with this lieutenant. So in anticipating this big battle with the Indians, he knew that lieutenant was going to be a thorn in his side, so he got sent him off on an idiot mission. You know, count the rocks in the creek bed or whatever, just get him out of his face for a few days, so he could do what he wanted to do without that lieutenant being around. And, of course, Little Bighorn happened. They sent Custer's saddle home without him in it. And uh, that was the end of him. So L Lieutenant Hall survived the 7th Cavalry. You cannot say he survived Bighorn because he wasn't there. There were two survivors on the, on the U.S. Army side of Little Bighorn. That was a horse named Comanche, ironically, and an Indian scout named Curly. And that was it. Nobody else, nobody else survived from the Army side. Uh, but um, after the war, after the Battle of Bighorn happened, he was reassigned to another unit. He went on, progressed up through the ranks. And by the time of the Spanish-American War in the 1890s, William P. Hall was himself Brigadier General. William P. Hall. He attained the rank Custer wanted ironically. And during the, the Spanish-American War in the 1890s, uh, Hall distinguished himself, gaining himself the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. After the Spanish-American War ended, he retired from the Army, went back to St. Louis. He was on a streetcar one day, picked up a, two tracks that somebody had dropped on a streetcar, read those tracks from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, or the Watchtower Tract Society, it was the first call, uh, and uh, he read those tracts, liked what he read, ordered the studies of the scriptures, read the books, came into the truth. In fact, he was a very close associate of Pastor Russell, Charles Taz Russell. And when Brother Russell made his trip around the world 
to determine where was he going to set up branch offices, William P. Hall was his associate, was traveling with him. He was one of the, one of the uh, entourage that went with him there. Now, they're in the Philippines in 1912, after the Spanish-American War ended about 10 or so years earlier. And all those properties that had been Spanish possessions uh, prior to the Spanish-American War were now overseen by the United States until they could establish their, their own independent governments. So they had a, a military governor of the Philippines was uh, Major General J. Franklin Bell. Major General J. Franklin Bell was a graduate of U.S. Military Academy, West Point, New York, class of 1866. Classmate of William P. Hall's. And William P. Hall, being with Brother Russell in the, in the Philippines at the time, went to the governor's mansion. Uh, they were reintroduced again after many years of being apart. And he told uh, the governor, says, General, there's a very well-known Bible lecturer is speaking at the Manila Opera House this week, and he'd be very pleased, sir, if you would be his chairman. And the governor says, if he's a friend of yours, General, he's a friend of mine, I'd be happy to do that. So with the governor as the chairman, how could the clergy cancel the contract? But now here's some things to ponder. Why did that lieutenant not have to be at Little Bighorn? Why did he, after the war, go to St. Louis and pick up two tracks that someone had dropped on the streetcar he happened to be riding? And why did he happen to be with Brother Russell in Manila when his classmate was the governor? Yeah, and these coincidences are getting a little too coincidental, aren't they? It's a little like, uh, yeah, well, what did that watchtower say? That Jehovah can manipulate things if it suits his will. And so we have to wonder, did he on that occasion do just exactly that? By the way, that's Brigadier General William P. Hall, who became your brother, just brother, no, no title, just brother William P. Hall. And right here, if you can see, that's the Congressional Medal of Honor that he received. The Medal of Honor was given to him after he uh, retired from the military. And Medals of Honor can be given to the recipient by none other than the President of the United States. Medals of Honor must be given to the recipient by the President. And the President who gave Brother Hall his Medal of Honor was Teddy Roosevelt, who happened to be his commander during the Spanish-American War. And now, now you get the, the Congressional Medal. You don't just walk into the office, here's your medal, okay, take off, I'll see you later. No, they spend half a day with him. The entire morning they spend, and they have lunch, and they have the ceremony, and then it's over. So he spent the morning with the President of the United States, and what do you think he talked about the whole time? Teddy Roosevelt knew all about the kingdom of God. So uh, that works. Interesting the way things uh, work out for Jehovah. Okay, let's talk about uh, gaining the liberty that we have to preach this good news of the kingdom. Philippians 1.7 says we have to defend and legally establish the good news. Now, in the 1930s, 1940s, we had a lot of little municipalities and governments and states were trying to pass laws prohibiting our work. We had uh, in uh, Minersville, Pennsylvania, uh, they tried to say that Jehovah's Witness children had to salute the flag at school. They had laws that said we couldn't preach on Sunday. They had laws that said we, had, we couldn't ask for money donation from people who wouldn't leave the literature with them. They had all kinds of laws trying to say that we had to get a permit to preach. Uh, so all these laws that passed against us trying to stop the work, the president of the Watchtower Society at the time was Joseph F. Rutherford, who was himself a lawyer and had for a time been a judge in Missouri. And he knew that you can waste a lot of time and a lot of money taking these things to the courts. So he came up with a strategy. He says, we are going to litigate, lose, appeal. Litigate, lose, appeal. Until we get to the Supreme Court, that's when we're going to dig in our heels and we're going to fight till the end of it. And we have taken 49, that I know of, 49 cases to the Supreme Court and have won practically all of them. One case that we lost was in 1940. 
I mentioned it, Minersville, Pennsylvania, versus the Gobitis family, uh, when they said that our kids had to salute the flag. Well, the um, court at the time, Supreme Court, the, the uh, chief justice was Charles Evans Hughes, who hated Jehovah's Witnesses with a fervor. And um, he, the chief justice has some influence over the associate justices. Not a lot, but enough to sometimes, if there's a little sway there, then not teetering which way to go, he can make them go his way. And the chief justice put the pressure on the rest of the court, only had one of the nine justices who voted on our behalf, and that was Harlan Stone. Now, Chief Justice Hughes was not unlike Chief Justice Rehnquist at the time. He was very old and very frail, and he did what, brother, what uh, Justice Rehnquist did. He passed away shortly after this case in 1940. Now, the replacement to the Chief Justice seat must come from the eight associate justices. They cannot take a person from the outside and make him the chief justice. It's got to be somebody who's already confirmed as a justice of the Supreme Court, which is going to be an uphill fight to get this one that uh, the president wants now because he really hasn't sat with the court, so that may or may not happen. We'll have to wait and watch and see how that goes down, but at least he is a justice of the court at this point. Could be. We'll wait and see. But the justice of the eight who was selected to be the chief justice was guess who? Harlan Stone the only one who voted for us in the flag salute case. Now, he's got to be replaced because he's not chief justice. Somebody's got to fill his seat. He comes from outside. And the replacement for his seat as a justice on the Supreme Court was Frank Murphy, who was the governor of Michigan. Now, Michigan has the same law that Virginia has, and that is that the governor must have his portrait painted can't be a photograph. Must be a, a painted portrait uh, of the president uh, to be hung in the Capitol building. Now, the portraitist they hired to do the painting of Frank Murphy was a man by the name of Roy Gamble. That doesn't mean much to you, I'm sure, but if you had known him, you would have called him Brother Gamble because he's one of Jehovah's Witnesses. This is in the 40s when there's only, you know, just a handful. I came in the truth in 1954, and there's only 500,000 witnesses on the planet at the time, uh, and less than a fourth of those in the United States. So there's a very small number of witnesses uh, at that time, and the portraitist, of all the portraitists they could have hired, the one they got to paint his picture was a witness. Now, the thing is that while the picture's being painted, the principal has got to stand stock still four days, can't move while well, the picture's painted, right? The portraitist can do all the moving and talking he wants to do. And so Frank Murphy got an earful during the days that he's painting the picture. And when it was painted, he told Brother Gamble, if this flag thing goes back to the Supreme Court again, I'll see that it gets a fair hearing. That's all we ask. We don't want anybody to pull strings. All we want is fair. Well, it did go back in 1944. And we battled that thing out in 1944. And June 14th, 1944, ironically, that's Flag Day, the decision was handed down that, that no one can be forced to salute the flag in school. We won it six to three. So why was Harlan Stone the one selected to be the chief justice? Why was the poet portraitist hired uh, one of Jehovah's Witnesses who... See what I'm saying? Is that, is, is, isn't that just coincidence? Or is Jehovah manipulating things to cause his will to be done? Well, you, you can decide on that yourself. Interesting thing, Jehovah's people have pioneered many things. Among them were, um, in 1912, something that Brother Russell initiated was the photodrama of creation, which is a talking motion picture. And the same time period, what's his name? Griffin... Got his name written down here somewhere. T.W. Griffith came out with the movie Birth of the Nation in 1915. Of course, that was a very racist film, if you know anything about it. It was uh, not very nice, but talking about how slavery was good and all that kind of stuff, Birth of a Nation. Uh, he spent, on that film, he spent uh, $100,000 to make that movie and made millions on it. 
The photodrama of creation cost $300,000 to produce and it was shown free of cost around the world. So we engineered and, and, and started that. Um, interesting little sidebar to that now has to do with the um, where all the money came from. Of course, a lot of it came from Brother Russell's fortune itself, but that's not the only source of money. In Atlanta, Georgia, in 1865, when General Sherman went through Georgia, he got to Atlanta and he burned every home of every wealthy person in Atlanta, except one. There was a home of a very aristocratic Spanish lady. Her name was Neely Pratt. Now, Miss Pratt was a real lady, southern lady, and uh, after the war, her daughter married a man named William Heath. William Heath was the uh, first secretary treasurer of an upstart company in Atlanta that was making a tonic out of coca leaves and cola nuts. Did it register yet? the Coca-Cola Company in Atlanta, Georgia, and they needed money to work. They needed capital to get going, and since Neely didn't have her house burned, she had some money. And she was one of the first investors in the Coca-Cola Company, which parlayed that into a fortune. And then in 1879, when the Watchtower started being printed, she was one of the first subscribers. She became one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And she helped to finance the photodrama of creation. Now, why, of all those big, beautiful homes in Atlanta, did Sherman miss one? Was it like he couldn't see it? It wasn't big enough to notice. The home is still standing, and it's on the register of historical buildings, and it's still on tour. If you go to Atlanta, you can tour the home of Neely Pratt today. By the way, her grandson, William Heath Pratt um, Jr., William Pratt Heath Jr., uh, Bill uh, Heath, as a lot of people knew him, was a Bethelite. He was in line to be the next secretary treasurer of the Coca-Cola Company, but he decided to be a coal porter instead, went to Bethel and was there until he died just not too many years ago. So interesting stories that come out of this. Last story has to do with the construction of the, the uh, Sands Street building at the corner of J and Sands, the 90 Sands building in, in Brooklyn. Um, when that building was under construction, we build our own buildings everywhere on earth except New York City. We cannot build anything in New York City. We have to hire union workers to build the building itself, the, the, the structure. The interior, that's ours. We can do anything we want to the interior, but the, the structure has got to be built by union labor. That's law in New York City. Well, the, the uh, union sent out two of the bricklayers were brothers who were working on the crime, and just ha happened to be their brothers working on Jehovah's building. They thought it was kind of neat to be there. But they saw that one crew of bricklayers was doing really substandard work on one part of the wall. It was so substandard that they knew it would compromise the integrity of the building in not too many years. But now, they're in a dilemma. If they tell on these other union workers, they will never work again. The union will see that they never get work again because you don't rat on your guys. you know. But by the same token, it's Jehovah's building. They couldn't do nothing. So they think, what are we going to do? So they talked it over among themselves. They said, well, look, we'll go home tonight and we'll pray. And we'll let Jehovah decide what we should do tomorrow. And the forecast for that night was clear skies. But a windstorm blew into Brooklyn that night, ripped loose a piece of scaffolding that battered nothing but that one piece of wall those men had been working on, so that by the time they got on the job the next morning, all those bricks were out on the floor. And when they walked on the job, the brothers said they heard those other bricklayers look at that, looked at each other and said, we ain't monkeying with this Jehovah guy, okay? <laughs> but, you know, where did that storm come from? 
Why did that windstorm come up that was not predicted by any of the weathermen in New York City, who has the best weathermen there are, right? They didn't know that one's coming. Jehovah snuck that one in on them, see? And if you look at that building today, you'd say, my, what a beautiful testimonial to Jehovah's name. So, what's the point of all this? Jehovah is in control. There are things that are happening in your life, perhaps, that make you wonder, okay, now what? Never forget, Jehovah is with his people. As long as we're doing Jehovah's will, his way, then Jehovah is in control. And that includes Chesterfield County, Virginia. Never forget, Jehovah is with you, his people.